Okay, so the meeting is now being recorded. Um, before I introduce our speaker, our, our speaker is Christy Sullivan. Um, I want to I want to thank Cornell Cooperative Extension for their investment in this technology. It's a significant investment, um, but it it's uh, it's it's quite beneficial just in the in the savings that we have in terms of delivering this education. We have people from uh, five or six different states, uh, ranging from Maine to Florida. So clearly, the the travel cost there would have been significant. Um, what I'd also like to do is uh, have you vote, if you will. These are some standard votes. Some of you have seen these before, and that's okay. The first first uh, poll I want you to take, you're gonna you're gonna click two boxes, one from the first two, and one from the bottom five. This gives us an indication of whether you've participated in these forestry webcasts before what your experience with uh, in-person workshops or seminars are. Those would be forestry workshops and seminars. So we'll take just a minute to do that. We can, you can see the results, I can see the results, and see that we have 21 of 29 people clicking in now, 23 of 29. So we'll get a couple more folks. Looks like we have uh, some Pretty good turnout of previous webcast viewers, but still a good showing of uh, people that are, this is their first webcast. So welcome to you. I'll give you another couple of seconds. We do these polls. There are three polls. I'll warn you in advance. There are three polls. They're painless, I hope, but they're really useful for us to help gauge the, the, the need for this kind of technology. Okay, I'm going to close this poll tuck it away and then there's one other poll that's even easier because you only need to check one box. This is the number of acres that you own or manage forest land acreage that you own or manage annually. Our final poll will come at the end of the presentation so stick around for that please. 22 of 31 people sounding in. We've got a couple more if you could join us. That would be great with casting your vote. All right, I'll close this poll. And with this, I'm, uh, I'll now introduce our speaker, Christy Sullivan. She is a colleague of mine here in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell University. And has spent a lot of, of time working with um, research time and extension time and observational time working with ways and strategies to enhance forest biodiversity. And she's, uh, she's joined us now for her second iteration of this presentation. I will turn it over to Christy to take it from here until uh, about 8 o'clock. So Christy, welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Pete. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to be talking about enhancing forest biodiversity. And before I get started, I just want to check one more time and make sure everybody can hear me okay. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. I just want to start and give a little bit of an overview about you know what is biodiversity. And biodiversity at the at the most minute level, um, I guess you could say, is genetic diversity. And that is that each individual has, um, is unique and genetic diversity allows a species to survive uh, over a wide range of conditions or a wider range of conditions or to adapt when conditions change. So for instance, you know, one species um, may live in several different states and may uh, individuals in the northern range of, their, of the northern part of their range might be slightly different than individuals at the southern part of their range. And um, by having differences, it allows if some um, individuals can't can't make it um, or have some sort of effects that are um, negative to them then at least you still have the others um, to kind of persist. Biodiversity is also at the next level species diversity basically you know from bacteria to bears and fungi to frogs and um, painted ladies to painted turtles um, no matter, uh, all these different individual species make up uh, biodiversity as well. 
And then at the next level, biodiversity is really the whole variety of physical environments and biotic communities that exist uh, within a region or over across the landscape. As you look out across the landscape, you can see uh, different arrangements and mosaics of different habitat types and different uh, land features. So biodiversity kind of can be viewed at, at a number of different levels, from the smallest genetic level up to the larger uh, regional or landscape level. So why should we care about biodiversity or forest biodiversity uh, specifically? Um, and I think we probably, everybody here tonight probably has a, a pretty good understanding, but I'll just you know go over some of the uh, some of the benefits of having forest biodiversity. And first of all, um, having very healthy functioning ecosystems provides us with some free life supporting services that support the life of uh, the species that we have as well as our own lives. Um, some of these services we don't even fully understand yet. And to quote Aldo Leopold, to keep every cog and wheel is a first precaution of intelligent tinkering. So you don't want to get rid of all your parts before you understand um, what their purpose is. So biodiversity in a healthy functioning ecosystem provides us with goods, things like food and fisheries, water, timber, um, in the northeast maple syrup, uh, fiber, and medicine, among other things. Healthy functioning forests also provide us with some regulating services. They can help to regulate our climate. They can help to uh, reduce the number of droughts and floods we experience. Um, healthy ecosystems help to minimize the amount of disease, um, has benefits to our air quality and our water quality, can control erosion, and can also filter wastes. To give a specific example from New York State, forests um, can purify our water. And in the Catskill watershed, um, they decided to uh, restore the watershed at a cost of $1 billion, as opposed to an artificial filtering system, which would have cost 6 to $8 billion. So by just um, going ahead and restoring the, the watershed and the forest within the watershed, we were able to save mil billions of dollars and um, also restore healthy functioning forests. Um, biodiversity in our forests can also provide other supporting services like uh, the formation of soils, nutrient cycling, and uh, very importantly, the, can pollinate, uh, um, enhance the pollination of crops and our natural vegetation. It also provides cultural services, things like um, outdoor recreation, a nice scenery to look at, a place that you can go just for contemplation and relaxation, a place to kind of get away from it all for a while. And um, having nice, healthy ecosystems gives us a feeling of overall well-being. Okay, so tonight what I want to talk about a little more specifically are ways to enhance forest biodiversity and, and things to kind of keep in mind. I'm going to try to cover um, invasive species. Uh, the importance of having species diversity, structural complexity and diversity in the forest, um, protecting our aquatic resources is within the forest, uh, the importance of uh, connectivity, having forests that are connected to one another, and then landscape heterogeneity, or having um, a landscape that's, that's diverse as well. To start off with, I just wanted to talk about invasive species. And this is a picture of Japanese barberry in the opening or understory of the forest. Japanese barberry um, does escape. It's a common ornamental plant and um, at one time was planted as a, encouraged to be planted as a wildlife food. Um, it, it is the berries will be eaten by birds and other wildlife, but uh, that's where the problem comes in because then they're dispersed far and wide. and they can take over in areas, especially if there's any uh, disturbance. So invasive species oftentimes develop into a monoculture um, and take over and outcompete other native vegetation. So instead of having a nice diverse understory, it's replaced with a big, thick monoculture of one species. Another invasive species that um, we see here a lot in New York State is uh, Japanese knotweed. Japanese knotweed takes, tends to grow um, 
in riparian areas. So may um, be very prevalent in a riparian forest area or anywhere um, along a wet area. And again, Japanese knotweed can kind of choke out native vegetation, establishes a big thick stand of just Japanese knotweed, and has been found um, by some researchers at, at Binghamton University and Cornell to have negative effects on amphibians that um, inhabit the area. Um, basically, um, as with a lot of invasive plants, uh, they don't uh, necessarily attract a lot of native insects. They haven't adapted, uh, you know, haven't uh, evolved with those insects. And so uh, the amount of food that's available in these areas can also be diminished. And uh, we talked at the, the earlier presentation about uh, the fact that some of the berries that are produced by some of these invasive species, uh, the honeysuckles, the non-native honeysuckles being one example, um, really aren't um, as high in nutrition as some of the native uh, native food plants. So it's important to um, kind of promote native species of trees and plants. And kind of in that same light, it's important to try to maintain a diversity of plant and tree species in your forest. Um, by having a diversity of species, you can um, help to provide food for wildlife in alternating years. Uh, for example, um, some oaks, like white oaks and red oaks, may not produce acorns in the same year. They may produce um, acorns in alternating years. If you have both of those types of oak in your forest, then you have a more consistent source of food for, uh, for wildlife. You can also um, try to um, provide food throughout the seasons by having a diversity of plant species. And um, having a diversity of species can help you to maintain resilience in the face of disease or other stressors in the forest. Um, for instance, if you um, have uh, only a couple of species in your forest and a uh, disease comes through or an insect, say um, have emerald ash borer, that I know is a topic that's going to be addressed in uh, one of the upcoming webcasts. And if you had a stand that only had ash and one other species and ash borer came through, you'd be left with, with just one species. And so having many, many species um, can help to uh, maintain resilience and make sure that your forest perpetuates in the face of these and other stresses. Here's another example of you know, maintaining diversity of understory trees and herbaceous plants to help you um, provide food throughout the seasons for wildlife. Um, we have an example in the upper right hand corner um, is sumac and sumac produces food that's available in the fall and the winter. Driving along the roads uh, right now I see that there's some sumac um, still persisting uh, right now. Um, Juneberry is in the lower right hand corner and Juneberry um, produces fruit in the springtime right around June. And then elder, elderberry in the left hand corner is uh, the berries are available in the summer. Okay, the next thing I wanted to touch upon is the importance of maintaining stand structural complexity. And I'm going to talk about that in two different sections. The first is uh, maintaining vertical structural diversity. And then the second is um, adding other key elements to enhance the structure within your forest. So what is vertical structure or vertical structural diversity? Well, it's basically uh, maintaining the different layers of vegetation in your forest. For example, the overstory, the midstory, the understory, the shrub layer, and then the, the uh, herbaceous vegetation on the forest floor. This is really important when it comes to uh, wildlife, particularly birds can be used as a good example, because birds um, are able to exist in an area with a lot of other species of birds without um, out competing one another because they divide the habitat vertically. So for instance, the scarlet tanager will use the canopy layer, the black-capped chickadee might um, use the mid-story layer, and something like the oven bird would uh, nest and feed on the forest floor. So by kind of dividing the habitat vertically, many different species are able to exist in the same area. Um, some species, like the, the northern cardinal as an example, um, the males and the females actually feed at different heights in the vegetation. So they 
uh, divide it even you know, by the sex. I just wanted to show this slide of um, high vertical structural diversity. Um, basically, you know, there's definitely a, a canopy, and then there's a lot of understory and uh, shrub layer vegetation here, too. That's a, a po as opposed to this slide, where there's a low vertical structural diversity, where you basically have a canopy and then nothing else until you get to the forest floor, and then it's a monoculture of uh, ferns. That would be a less desirable situation. To kind of um, highlight the importance of stru vertical structural diversity and how it affects wildlife, I wanted to um, touch upon a study that was conducted by New York Audubon Society um, in New York State where they looked at mostly the effects of timber harvesting on forest songbirds and amphibians. So uh, what they did was they looked at um, forested sites uh, and categorized them into four conditions. The first condition was uh, mature, and those were forests that either had not been cut recently or had been very lightly thinned. The second condition was moderate partial harvest, which is uh, 20 to 30 percent removal of the canopy. The third condition was heavy partial harvest, where 40 to 60 percent of the canopy was removed. And then the fourth was uh, clear cut, where almost 100 percent of the canopy had been removed. Since there are many, many different bird species, um, instead of looking at each individual bird, although they did you know, look at quite a few of them, but for the purposes of this presentation, um, they grouped the birds into uh, groups according to past habitat preference or uh, looking into literature um, research from the past, you know, what were the preferences that these birds had shown. And they grouped them into uh, mature forest birds or birds that had been uh, shown to prefer areas where there were many large trees or a, a closed canopy. And then early successional forest species, uh, basically a young forest like you would find in, um, in a clear-cut situation. I wanted to give you an example of what some of these birds might be. And this isn't all inclusive by any means, just a sampling of some of the species that they included in these two different groups. Um, for the early successional forest bird group, they included the chestnut-sided warbler. And the chestnut-sided warbler is probably the most abundant early successional forest bird that we have in our forests. Also the common yellowthroat, which exists in um, early successional forests and also in, in wetland areas. Black and white warbler. The veery. Cedar waxwing, which is a bird that we oftentimes see in suburban areas or park-like areas, too, feeding on uh, the fruit of shrubs and trees. Gray catbird, which um, makes it's called a catbird because it makes a sound kind of like a meowing sound, and it nests in shrubs. Indigo bunting, which is a really uh, striking small blue bird that uh, also nests in the shrub layer. And the eastern towhee is another um, pretty common early successional forest bird. Um, supposedly says, drink your tea um, when it makes its call. Okay, so when they looked at this, these birds and they, as a group and looked at um, their abundance in the different forest condition categories, they found that um, these birds as a group were uh, most abundant in um, the clear cuts, um, but they were also present in the heavy partial harvest and to a lesser degree in the moderate partial harvest. And they were even present in some of the mature forests. So they, they weren't as abundant there, but they did, um, they did use that habitat and um, were most abundant, though, in the clear cut areas, which is what you would expect. Okay, when they looked at the mature forest birds, these were birds uh, like the oven bird. And the oven bird is a very small bird um, with a very loud call. And it's called an oven bird because it nests on the ground and creates a nest that, um, kind of a domed nest with a, a, a hole in the side that they enter in, being a cup nest. 
at this little, it's almost like an igloo on the ground, like an old-fashioned oven. They also included the black-throated green warbler, which is also a pretty abundant forest bird in this area. The black-throated blue warbler, which um, likes mature forests but nests in the shrub layer of mature forests. The red-eyed vireo, which is probably our most, most abundant bird in the northeast forest. The wood thrush, which looks is a thrush like the viri, uh, looks a little bit different, and the, the call is similar but different, and it prefers you know the different types of habit type of habitat. The blue-headed vireo, and the white-breasted nuthatch, which is a common feeder bird that we see oftentimes at bird feeders, and then the scarlet tanager, which is very a very striking bird. Uh, the male is this bright red with the black wings, and the female is a more uh, kind of a drab olive color. Okay, so when they looked at the mature forest birds as a group, they found that the, those birds were most abundant in the mature forest and the moderate partial harvest, uh, a little less abundant in the heavy partial harvest where the canopy had been opened up a little bit more, and the least abundant in, uh, in clear cuts, though they were s still found there at times. So just to summarize, for birds in general, uh, the species that you'll have in a forest will vary according to the forest conditions and specifically the, the structure of the forest. Uh, management affects biodiversity. In, um, you know, in the slides that I, sh I showed previously, you could see that um, although you would have fairly different groups of birds in a mature f forest that hadn't really been cut versus a clear cut, those two conditions in between, the moderate partial harvest and the heavy partial harvest, tended to um, have kind of an overlap of, of uh, a mixture of early successional and mature forest species. You might have a higher diversity overall of species if, uh, you know, if you had opened up the canopy a little bit to a lot and had uh, encouraging, you know, the shrubs layer to grow and the understory to grow and um, so encouraging that extra uh, vertical structural diversity. So um, once again, strong similarities and also noticeable differences were apparent among species, groups, and conditions. Okay, they also looked at the red-backed salamander. Um, they uh, were looking at amphibians in general in the forest, but um, the red-backed salamander was about 95% of the animals that they found when they were looking. Um, the red-backed salamander is probably the, it's the most abundant vertebrate in New York forests, probably the most abundant in Northeast forests, according to research studies that have been conducted um, throughout the Northeast. And so they're very important in terms of um, our forest ecosystems and the health of those forest ecosystems. Um, for example, they're very important as as prey, as prey, a lot of uh, animals will feed on them. Wild turkeys scratching through the leaf litter uh, will feed on a, uh, redback salamanders when they find them. And then, um, uh, let's see, small mammals will feed on them. And then they're also very important as predators. They feed on the invertebrates on the forest floor, and those invertebrates are um, what the invertebrates that break down leaf litter on the forest floor. And so by feeding on them, they can kind of control the amount of decomposition that's happening and the, the rate of nutrient release to the plants on the forest floor. So they're very um, integral parts of our forest ecosystem. When they looked at the redback salamander in different forest condition categories, um, they found that uh, they were most abundant in a mature forest with a closed canopy. Um, less abundant in a moderate partial harvest, uh, even less abundant in the heavy partial harvest, and uh, the least abundant in the clear cut situation. And that's pretty much what you would expect with the uh, redback salamander or even amphibians in general. Um, these animals don't have much to protect their skin. Uh, they breathe uh, through their skin, and in order to be able to for respiration to take place, their skin has to be moist. So they're very prone to drying out. And um, whenever you open up the canopy, you create a drier kind of a, a drier 
and a little more hostile conditions for for these uh, for this animal. Uh, when they looked at the other amphibians, uh, forest flora amphibians, and they kind of put them all in a group because they weren't as abundant. Um, things like the slimy salamander, the dusky salamander, the spring peeper, the spotted salamander, and the wood frog. Looked at them as a group. They pretty much found the same kind of trends. Now, um, you know, this is just two groups they looked at. So with songbirds, it was very diverse and it depended on the structure. With the amphibians, it was fairly predictable. If um, you know, they didn't look at other groups like reptiles or or mammals, but um, you know, with reptiles, you would expect to see the opposite. You would expect to see probably more of our uh, forest snakes, um, for instance, in a, a clear-cut or uh, warmer situation, heavy partial harvest, than you would in a mature forest. So it depends on the group that you're looking at, and the vertical structure uh, really will affect which organisms are present there. I wanted to show that uh, in the former slides, uh, they were looking at amphibian abundance. This slide kind of shows the uh, number of species of amphibians that were found in the different uh, forest conditions. And it really doesn't vary all that much, really only by one or two species at most. But um, but you can see there that you have um, either the same number of species in a mature and a heavy partial harvest, maybe, um, or maybe one or two more in a moderate partial harvest. So um, by having that structural diversity, even for amphibians, it did affect the number of species. And you may have more species of amphibians, um, even though they might not be as abundant, when you had that greater structural diversity. So in summary, for the amphibians, uh, most amphibians prefer the moist conditions uh, that occur when you have a lot of shade in a closed canopy. And they were more abundant in the mature forests. The take-home messages that I wanted to stress with the vertical structure is that forest management changes vertical structure and the species composition. Um, the resulting forest structure heavily influences which organisms will live there. The highest species diversity occurs in moderately or heavily thinned uh, stands, which have greater structural diversity. And um, it's also important to have a diversity of stand ages and structures in a region, so not necessarily within one ownership, but across the landscape, in order to provide for um, you know, all of these different groups of organisms. OK, so I showed this slide before, and I see that, uh, that Kevin asked um, if a high deer population will then lead to less vertical structural diversity. And uh, that's what this slide, I'm using it again to illustrate that exact point. What's working against us here? Well, in this stand, you can bet that uh, deer have had a, a pretty big effect when you don't see any understory and you wind up with uh, a monoculture of ferns on the forest floor. That's a sure sign that um, deer are fairly abundant and having an effect on the structure of the forest and the future of our forest. I wanted to show as an example a deer exclosure um, that we put up at Cornell's Arnott Forest. That's our teaching and research forest. And uh, you can see the only difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this slide is that um, deer are fenced out of the left-hand side. And this was after, I think, only one growing season, one full growing season. So there was already a big difference. This is another um, example. As you are looking at this slide, you can see the, the fencing and um, so the wires are right there. And you're looking at the fenced area where deer um, are fenced, the area that deer are fenced out of. And this is from the other side of the fence looking out to the area where deer um, still are. And I just want to point out that this area right here um, you can see kind of the browse line. It's called the browse line, where up to about five feet, five to six feet in height. It's basically deer have eaten everything up as far as they can reach. They don't have anything on the forest floor in terms of herbaceous vegetation, and there's really uh, little or no um, shrubland. So deer can uh, prevent regeneration from happening, and they can also change the species composition in our forests. 
And that's because deer have a preference for certain species over others. So by browsing on the kinds of plants and, and tree seedlings that they prefer, then they're um, actually eliminating those or reducing their presence in the forest. And others that they don't prefer as much um, have the advantage. And so you wind up with the less diversity and um, you know, deer really affecting the, the species that are present in the future forest, as well as our present forest. So um, deer are basically, they're considered a keystone species in that they have the ability to affect their own habitat as well as the habitat of other wildlife. And um, in studies in the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania, um, they've shown that um, deer have affected the, the number of songbirds that are present in a forest and also the species of wildflowers that are present in a forest. Anybody, I don't know if anybody's noticed areas where um, you know, there, maybe there were a lot of trillium in the past, and now you've seen that the trillium uh, decrease. You don't see them flowering as much in the spring. Um, but sometimes uh, deer are having an effect on our, our wildflowers and trilliums. Just one example of that. Okay, so um, in addition to the vertical structural diversity of a forest, which is you know basically the, the vegetation component, there are other ways that you can enhance the, the complexity of the structure in any given stand, regardless of stand age. Um, and one of those ways, one of the main ways, is to uh, retain large dead trees, also referred to as snags, and also uh, some large living trees that can serve as recruit trees, becoming you know, uh, snags or dead trees in the future. Uh, these trees are really very, very important. Um, along with cavity trees, as you see pictured on the right in this slide. Um, cavity trees are basically any trees with, with holes in them, and they can be dead or, or live. Oftentimes live trees, especially um, American beech, is a good example of a tree that, that frequently um, you'll find cavities in a live tree. Um, this slide on the left-hand side, you see a large snag. And you can see some fungi growing on that snag. And so the you know the fungi and then the insects is that that standing dead tree rots. Um, insects are attracted to that spot, and then it kind of feeds as a little restaurant for wildlife. So a lot of birds will come and feed there. Um, it's a great place. You know, woodpeckers will come and feed there. They'll excavate cavities, and then uh, you have species, many many species of wildlife that use cavities for uh, either winter cover or summer cover or or nesting cover. And uh, some examples of those would be the black-capped chickadee, which is uh, the top picture there. Uh, black-capped chickadees nest in cavities in trees, um, as well as many woodpeckers. Um, of our owls, like the, uh, the screech owl, eastern screech owl, uses cavities. Um, many mammals, raccoons and porcupines, some mice, and some snakes, like the black rat snake will use cavities. Uh, squirrels, of course, and, and a whole, just a whole host of wildlife uses tree cavities. So really by um, including these structures in your forest, you are, it's a great way, um, probably one of the, the best ways to enhance the biodiversity of your forest. I would mention, too, that um, in terms of specific rec recommendations, um, what I've usually seen is uh, somewhere between three to five or four to six snags per acre as a recommendation. In addition to standing dead wood, um, dead wood on the forest floor is also very important. Uh, for instance, logs left laying on the forest floor will provide um, cover for amphibians, like the spotted salamander pictured in the right-hand corner, um, as well as other amphibians. As I mentioned before, amphibians are, are prone to drying out, and so in the sum hot summer months, they really seek out uh, moist cover um, under logs or under leaf litter. Um, and when logs are decaying and really starting to break down, if you've ever kind of torn into one, you, you see that it's re they're very sponge-like, and they can be very, very wet inside, even in the hottest and driest summer months. And oftentimes, you'll find you know, a spotted salamander or other salamanders actually inside that wood. Uh, logs laying on the forest floor can also provide um, 
cover for snakes, our, our woodland snakes, um, sites that small mammals travel along to feed. Um, there are um, rough grouse will use large logs for drumming sites during the breeding season. Uh, wild turkeys like to lay their eggs at the base of a log, right behind the log. So many, many different species um, use dead wood on the forest floor. On the left-hand corner, that there's a picture that I've included of a log pile on a an old log on a log landing. And in the past, um, most of the time, for aesthetic reasons, um, best management practices for log landings include um, getting rid of those butt ends or burying them underground so that it's not unsightly. We've done some research at the Arnott Forest that's uh, shown that these structures are, are really, if you can just pile them up to the side so maybe they're not as obvious, but right along the edge of the log landing, um, kind of as a you know interface of where you know, the forest hits the log landing, can really be um, important for attracting and providing cover for our woodland snake species. Um, as well as some, some other things like we have at the Arnott Forest, a species of special concern, the uh, northern coal skink. It's a lizard that's um, not terribly common in, in New York State or, or in Pennsylvania, for that matter. It occurs in both, uh, both of those states. And um, the northern coal skink has been found in, in uh, several different sites that we have where we've um, had the logger um, pile up the butt ends and make piles into them instead of burying them or or um, pushing them off completely to the side. So um, these sites also are good overwintering sites for butterflies, for instance, and um, attract small mammals. And then in turn, those small mammals um, provide food for things like red-tailed hawks and other raptors that might be feeding at these openings. Right, so in addition to um, the dead wood, either standing or on the ground, Another really important thing to keep in mind in terms of increasing the biodiversity in our forests is to protect and maintain uh, aquatic features, so things like our streams. And to the left here, I have pictured a, a shallow woodland pool, or they're also called vernal pools. These are areas that may hold water for part of the year and uh, dry up in the summer months, but then uh, fill up again in the springtime. And they're very, very important breeding sites for amphibians, and uh, a lot of different wildlife species will come to get water here, and they're just a very, very integral part of our forest ecosystems. So the aquatic features in our forests are critically important to biodiversity, not only to our aqu aquatic organisms, but also to many of our terrestrial or upland organisms that, that um, really also rely partially on these aquatic features to complete their life cycles. So for instance, um, some amphibians like the wood frog and the spotted salamander, the Jefferson salamander, they'll go to these uh, shallow woodland pools in the springtime and they may only spend a week or two weeks of the entire year there. They breed and they lay their eggs and then they move off and spend the rest of the year uh, in the forest. So um, even though they're not using these uh, aquatic sites all year round, they're, they're critical for them to um, um, another um, thing that's very important in terms of forest biodiversity is to maintain connectivity between and among habitat patches. So basically um, having those patches be connected somehow so that organisms can move from one patch to another. One way to do this is to uh, ensure buffers along riparian corridors. Um, oftentimes uh, animals will move along these um, aquatic features and so having a nice buffered, you know, nice forested area along uh, the stream provides a, a nice corridor for movement. Um, and also to maintain the, the connections between forests and the aquatic habitats. So as I mentioned in the, in the previous slide uh, with woodland pools and uh, the animals that, that use them, they also use the adjacent forests, so maintaining a connection between those um, those areas, so uh, the forested areas and the aquatic areas is very important. A forest fragmentation is probably one of the greatest threats to biodiversity that uh, we have, especially here in the Northeast. As you can see in this slide, um, 
As forests are, are broken up or broken into smaller pieces by any activity, whether it be development uh, for housing development or any other activity, you can picture, if you can imagine that uh, you know an organism that lives down here for part of its uh, part of the year and then needs uh, moves up here to the the upper part of the slide for the rest of the year, that um, you know once the forest is fragmented, there's a barrier kind of to dispersal, um, a lot of danger to that animal as it moves uh, across roadways. Also, when forests are broken up into smaller chunks, you often have a higher number of predators, so things that might feed on, for instance, uh, bird eggs or bird nestlings, things like raccoons and possums and skunks. You'll have a greater abundance of those animals along edges or areas where uh, they're broken up um, into smaller, smaller parcels. So forest fragmentation is a serious threat to forest biodiversity. And this slide kind of illustrates that point. You can see here that this forest has kind of become an island um, on the landscape. There's, it's really not connected to, to any other large forest uh, tracks. And um, you can see even within this forest, there are, uh, it's been kind of broken up by, by roadways, small kind of minor roads and other activities. So um, it'll limit the number of area-dependent species that could live there. Um, and an area-dependent species is an area a species that requires a large area for its habitat, either because it has a, a large home range or because it has limited dispersal, it can't move um, uh, very far, or because it um, is affected by things like the increase in predators that, that you experience when you open or break the forest up into smaller parcels. So they, uh, forest fragmentation may disrupt migration patterns. It uh, tends to favor habitat generalists, things like deer. Uh, deer love the type of habitat we create when we have uh, subdivisions and whatnot. Uh, still cover available usually and there's usually plenty of very nutritional food that we provide in our shrubs, etc. So um, forest fragmentation will generally uh, benefit habitat generalists like deer and raccoons and possums, those types of animals. But habitat specialists usually won't do uh, very well. So forest fragmentation also can cause a decrease in the remaining quality of the remaining habitat and ecosystem health overall. And just um, back to maintaining connectivity for a moment here. Um, you can see in the upper left-hand corner where um, there's a, a woodland pool and there's a forested buffer around it, around this area. And so that's an area where the connectivity is maintained between the aquatic feature and the forested habitat. Now it's not always feasible to maintain a buffer that big around every aquatic feature, but in this instance, um, this isn't to the right here, this isn't really a, a great slide because it's not a good idea really to, to build up that close to the aquatic feature, but at least there's some connectivity maintained to the resulting, you know, the remaining forest um, at, on part, at least half of the, uh, around half of the pool there. So um, that's going to be really important to species like uh, the spotted turtle, which is right over here and uses those uh, woodland pools to uh, feed and kind of recharge when it comes out of hibernation before moving off into the woods a bit. Um, and also to these mole salamanders. Um, here's the Jefferson salamander, the spotted salamander, the marble sp salamander and the blue spotted salamander. Um, they similarly use both types of habitat. To the right over here is an example of just maintaining connectivity among the aquatic features in a forest to enhance biodiversity. Um, in this case, you know, you don't want to or you'd like to try to avoid putting um, roadways between those aquatic features that are going to separate them from one another and and prevent organisms from moving back and forth among those features. So whenever possible, it's a good idea to um, to try to route those uh, roadways and trails, etc., um, around the outside of a cluster of aquatic features.
this slide, I just thought it was a good slide um, to illustrate the uh, connections among forest patches. You can see that most of the forest here is somewhat fragmented, but at least it's connected by corridors and there's some access you know, from one patch to another. And so it maintains some of the integrity of the forest there on the landscape. And then and one of uh, one of the last points I wanted to make is that uh, maintaining landscape heterogeneity is very important as well. So what that means is that you want to maintain a, a mosaic of patches that represent different forest composition and age classes with different different structural conditions uh, across the landscape. And at first glance, this slide, um, this picture doesn't really seem, it looks like it's pretty much all contiguous mature forest and wouldn't provide much diversity. If you look off here to the right, you can see here's a, a very large patch, um, a cut that, that has taken place. So that's a, a younger forest. And I think off here in the back, too, there's, there's a quite a large cut. So there's you know, some stand you know, some structural diversity um, across the landscape that kind of enhances the, the regional biodiversity in the area. One way that you can ensure that you're contributing to landscape um, um, diversity is to get a feel for uh, how your land or your forest fits into um, the region. So get a get a feel for what other structures are out there. If you look at, at an aerial photo, um, do you see mostly mature forest that hasn't been cut? Do you see a lot of areas that um, already have been cut? You know what what could you add to the landscape? that might be different than the surrounding areas and would enhance the, uh, the wildlife, um, add something different for wildlife, or um, even you know, in terms of the species um, of you know, plant species diversity in the area. And so um, this is a really great time um, to, be, to be able to do something like that, um, you know, to get a, a picture of your own property from an aerial photo because there are so many different things coming online now. Um, really great site websites that provide um, access and free access to um, aerial photo aerial photos of um, like the entire state or many different states. In the case, uh, just for example, Google Earth is one of those. Um, if you do a search for Google Earth, um, you can download. They have a free program that you can download um, to your computer. And um, you can kind of zoom in right to your uh, to your own property and kind of get a bird's eye view of how it fits in to the overall landscape. Um, Microsoft Live Search is another site um, that's available, and they have some excellent, really high quality images. And again, that's for uh, the entire country. Uh, Google Earth is um, worldwide; even it's a, a great place you can just go and get a. a look at even other countries and it's very it's useful for a lot of different purposes. In New York State we have the New York State GIS Gateway and uh, that's also an excellent site with just all of New York on it and you can download those maps for um, a, you know all different kinds of purposes but um, and somebody else uh, earlier today mentioned that Massachusetts also has a, a GIS Gateway and I'm not sure um, about the other states but it's definitely something that um, is becoming more and more common um, on a state-by-state -state basis as well. Okay, so I wanted to put these up. Um, I'm putting up the web links. These are actually, um, you can actually click on those when you see them, and it will take you to the sites right from here um, during the webcast. So if anybody wants to take some time to, to um, access either of those sites and, and take a look, um, again, Google Earth yeah, is something you have to download the program, but it's free and it's very quick to do. Um, but these other two sites um, you can access right from here and take a look and try to you know, get a feel for what the area is like uh, near you. So um, with that, that uh, kind of what, let's see. I see that Eric Jones says that New Hampshire has uh, as a granite GIS site. Okay, that's very good to know. Thank you, Eric. And um, uh, that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to, to uh, answer or try to answer any questions that you have at this time. Christy, um, actually, while people are 
are thinking about some of those questions, how about if we bring up the third and final okay. poll? And uh, I'll get folks, if you could just uh, read through this, um, click all the boxes that apply, and then we'll get that out of the way so that so that you can see those web links and also give you a chance to start formulating some questions. This was Christy did a, another great job and I appreciate that. We have uh, 27 of 35 people who've connected. Or 27 of, of uh, 35 people who are connected have, have voted, so give you a couple more minutes to, to click the boxes that apply. And then get that out of the way. Feel free, of course, to start typing in your questions. Uh, Christy will be able to read down through those, and when we get the, get the uh, survey number three off the screen, we'll move the chat pod over so that we can, we can all see it see the text a little bit more easily. It looks like the survey responses have slowed down, so I'm going to close this, get this pod out of the way. Let's see. Okay, so Paul, you're saying that um, Pennsylvania has some that are county-based, so county by county? Okay, uh, Peter has asked about uh, the use of stocking of stock for replanting, and is there a way to ensure proper genetic diversity, and is it ever considered? Um, I I think yes, it is considered. I'm not really sure if there's a surefire way to to ensure that you have proper genetic diversity unless the plants were grown from local, you know, local or regional um, sources, uh, seed sources, and um, that can be kind of hard to track down. Um, I I think you may try like your state. Uh, for instance, in New York State, we have New York State DEC. And they distribute tree seedlings. You, um, that might be a good place to start and asking, um, you know, where their stock comes from. Um, so I think it's important. It should be an Im important consideration. But I don't know about the availability. Um, you know, I think it probably depends on availability in your area. And it's, but it's a good question to ask when you go to buy trees because then, um, you know, the sources who are who are selling trees might, you know, start thinking about it more. And um, yeah, you can ask the nursery for the the source of the seeds that they use to grow their seedlings. Hey, Walt, thank you very much. Walt's put up a source for more, more Pennsylvania maps from uh, the POSDA site at Penn State. Thank you, Paul, for a source for Pennsylvania seedlings from the Game Commission, Pennsylvania Game Commission. Thank you, Bob. Christy, I've, I've uh, clicked on both the the Pennsylvania site and the Massachusetts site for GIS information. 
and we can uh, we can add those to maybe make a a, a little um, simple document that we can put on the website associated with this presentation, and people can go there as if they want to relocate these um, URLs. Okay, thanks, Pete. That's a great idea. And Eric Jones also. I uh, mentioned um, MS Terra Server as a good map source, and, and that is, yes, that is definitely a good map source as well. Okay. Anybody have any additional questions or input for Christy? Oh, Herb asks about uh, wandering around Potter County um, and seeing some fenced-in areas. Um, I'm not really sure where that where that might have been. I'm familiar with Potter County, um, quite familiar with it actually, um, but I can't remember any places with a fenced-in area. There are some areas on um, some of the forest investment firms have um, uh, near. Um, Austin, between Cowdersport and Austin, and they had uh, you know the old um, electric fences, but they're that they're pretty old and run down at this point. They're no longer functioning as as effective fences. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where it might have been, but it's a great area to be to be wandering around in for sure, <laughs> even if you're lost. Below Portville, okay. And Bruce asks, how practical is it to try to fence out deer, especially on large tracks? Um, yeah, it can be extremely expensive and sometimes cost prohibitive depending on the area. Um, it can be very, very difficult. So sometimes it's uh, sometimes it isn't practical financially um, to be able to do that. On the other hand, if, you have, if you're very invested in a large area of land and you need to have regeneration, um, I don't, I don't at some point it may balance out and become economically more more uh, more feasible um, maybe another a better option is to try to control the deer population um, at the Arnott forest at Cornell we have a, an Ernebuck program where we've um, because we were having a difficult time getting trees to regenerate we um, implemented a special hunting program where uh, our hunters that hunt at the Arnott um, they have permits to hunt there it's a 4,000 500 acre area and um, they have to harvest two does before they can shoot a buck. So by doing so we've been able to lower the deer population and to balance the number of uh, the number of ratio of bucks to doe so we're seeing uh, more bucks at the forest and also allows uh, the bucks to get a little bit older um, and, and larger so it provides a different type of, of hunting experience, a quality hunting experience and uh, hopefully more quality deer and hopefully enables us to uh, regenerate our forests a little bit better. So sometimes uh, I would, there may be other options. Um, Cynthia asks, there's concern about deer. What about moose? I don't know much about moose, to be honest. I don't know. <laughs> in, in New York, you know, the moose population is just, you know, starting to, to climb a bit and um, and I, I really don't know much about the effects that moose have on on forest land. Brian says in Pennsylvania, if you want trees, you need fence. Thank you, Brian. Three to five dollars per linear foot, I'm assuming. Won't a balance eventually be struck between deer and the their food source? Um, yes, at some point they w there will for sure. Um, the problem is that in many areas of of New York and, and Pennsylvania is an even better example. There have been so many deer, um, like too many deer for the habitat, 
for such a long time that it's had a it, it's had a pretty serious effect, a long term effect on the the forest. And until you reduce the deer um, populations to a lower level and allow that habitat to to come back, um, you're never really going to be able to have as many. You know, you could basically if you let the the habitat recover. The only way to do that might be by reducing the number of deer initially. That's the best way to have good deer habitat and healthy deer herds in the future, as well as healthy forests and diverse wildlife in general, or <laughs> bigger fences. Hey, uh, Bill is asking about a, a webcast to, to address DEC DMAP permits. Um, we could consider that. I'm not, I, I think the, the best strategy is if you live in New York to contact your local office of the Department of Environmental Conservation and talk with the Division of Wildlife, the deer biologist, about the process to acquire those DMAP permits. Forest owners can get them if they have 200, an aggregate of, I think, 200 acres of forest land. Does that sound right, Christy, or other people in New York who have experience? Uh, farmers, agricultural lands can get it with a much smaller acreage, maybe on the order of 80 acres. Uh, so I think call them up, and the, either a deer biologist or a DEC forester will come out and validate that you have deer damage, and then it's a fairly simple matter of, of providing an application. Herb asks, what is a DMAP? Uh, DMAP is an acronym for Deer Management Assistance Program, and these are uh, permits that are given to property owners that uh, where they have the uh, ability to share those permits with people who hunt on their property and, uh, and shoot additional antlerless deer. And Kevin Albaugh has a website that I'm guessing deals specifically with those DMAP permits. So feel free to, to check that out. So um, Bill, is that is that provide you enough to get you started? I'm I'm not sure what uh, what more we would cover with the DMAPs. What I will say is. Uh, later this year, and I, I haven't scheduled a date yet, but we're going to have either Gary Goff or more likely I think it's going to be Paul Curtis, who is um, uh, one of the wildlife biologists here in this department, is going to be talking about the Ernebuck program that we've implemented at the r Not Forest. So, uh, you know, part of that will certainly be mention of the DMAPs and the process that we've gone through although maybe not in detail, the, the, what we'll be focusing on is the population dynamics of the deer herd and some of the, some of the um, indicators that we've used at the r Not Forest to, to, to show us that we have a deer problem, even though we still have what seems to be a very lush forest. So being too few acres, Bill, you need to talk to your neighbors. And if you, together with your neighbors, can get um, reach the threshold of acreage, then you should be able to get the permits. Um, the other option is to try and work through the political process and apply pressure to have the acreage threshold reduced. I'm not sure which is easier, working with your neighbors or working through the political process. Are there, are there any of you who are connected who've had successes as private owners getting uh, some kind of a, of a special deer management permit, either in New York or, uh, or in other states? You know, in Pennsylvania, in some areas, they've implemented some antler restrictions, and I think maybe also increased the availability of doe permits. Is that right, Christy? Um, they had increased the availability of doe permits and then kind of dropped back on that. But yes, they implemented some antler restrictions. 
Um, I believe it has to be three points on one side. So they've made it more, for those of you unfamiliar with this, they've made it more uh, restrictive to shoot a deer. Previously, a, a, a buck was defined in New York, for example, as having one three-inch antler. Um, in, in Pennsylvania, they've, they've raised the bar, if you will. Looks like we have several people typing in questions, so we'll wait for those to come in. We had one uh, just as a uh, point of uh, reference, maybe. If, if For those of you who are typing questions, we had a, a comment from a participant at the noon hour who said that he would repeatedly type questions and they would flash on his screen, but they wouldn't show up. So if any of you are having that same kind of a, of a phenomenon, one thing to check is to make sure in the, in the bottom right-hand corner of the chat pod, it should say, to everyone, because it's possible to send a, a private note just to, to one person. So make sure you're sending it to everyone. If you have trouble... Uh, sending a note, send me an email if you would please. You can just reply back to the to the email that I sent out announcing this webcast because I I need to find out if there are if there are problems with the software. We need to try and to try and uh, correct that. Okay, so uh, Christy, we have some comments from Eric and Cynthia and Robin. Uh, yes, I see Eric's question. Why does New Hampshire find it difficult to maintain a sizable deer herd while Pennsylvania and New York have too many? Um, I, I think it's probably just the, you know, the available habitat in Pennsylvania and New York. Um, and, you know, whereas, you know, New Hampshire would probably be more similar to, I would think, the, the Adirondacks in New York where you don't have as many deer, um, although that seems to be changing, um, a little bit too. But, um, I think it's just you know the the available habitat that that's here. Best shot. Cynthia says better hunters. I don't know. I don't know about that, but um, but um, I would say it's it's habitat based. And then Robin asks, what about damage done by porkies? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I'm not really sure specifically what can be done. Um, uh, let's see. I'm, I'm not really sure. I don't have any specific suggestions. Uh, I guess manage for fishers if you can't. <laughs> fishers eat porcupines. So, um, but I don't really have any specific suggestions uh, for porcupines. Um, you know, on specific trees, you can probably, um, there may be things that you can do to protect individual trees, but um, on the, the level of, a, of the entire forest, probably not much that can be done. I don't know if uh, porcupines are protected. Um, you know, they're not a game species in Pennsylvania, um, and I don't know what their status is actually in New York. If they can, you know, in New York State, they're, they, we have pretty flexible regulations in terms of um, wildlife damage and what you can do when any um, animal is causing damage to to your property. So, um, but I, I'd encourage you to just look at state the your state regulations and see um, what they. I put okay, so traps in their den trees. So yeah, in places where um, you know where they're not protected and that's that's um, allowable by law, then and trapping them or shooting them would be uh, a possibility. I, I'd like to also mention for the the New Hampshire situation. Um, in terms of deer and, and you know, also like uh, in the Adirondacks, is that the most limiting factor for deer is a heavy, persistent snow cover in the, uh, in the wintertime. So um, fawn survival is most affected by um, having a persistent, heavy snow cover. It makes it difficult for them to move around and to find food, um, and so it, it can really affect um, fawn survival. And that can have an, a regulating effect on the herd in you know the southern tier of New York and in Pennsylvania. Snow cover 
is rarely deep enough or persistent enough anymore um, these days anyway to, to really regulate um, survival of, of fawns. And so that allows the population to continue to increase because you continue to add you know, the fawns to the population. Uh, there was a there was one very heavy winter snow uh, with a lot of snow cover in New York um, time toward the late 90s and I forget which year it was specifically but but you could kind of see um, based on some of the data that was collected by DEC if you ran it in a, this one particular model you could see that uh, the deer population kind of stopped growing for, for at that point so for like a year it kind of Flatlined, but then you know it continued to climb again. So it was enough to keep it from growing, but not enough to knock it back very much. So Ian uh, Ian makes the observation that in Northern New York, many of the farmers are using deer permits um, as they relate to crop damage but other landowners don't particularly do it. So that might be a chance if you uh, have occasion to talk with your neighbors or other landowners or if you're a member of the local Forest Owners Association to encourage other people in your community to take advantage of those deer permits. That's um, on a landscape level, that's, that's an, an option to help try and control some of the deer damage. Um, and Peter asks about the flexibility in New York BMP, the best management practice guides to allow higher slash as a barricade for deer and protecting seedlings. I'm not aware of any statewide regulations that prohibit or prescribe um, anything about the height of slash. There may be some local town ordinances. Uh, I haven't heard of those that relate to slash. More often than not, it's an issue of landowner attitudes and uh, what they have as an aesthetic objective and how they view slash within that, in, in their objective uh, for aesthetics. Most landowners, when I talk to them and explain the benefits associated with slash and also the, the risk, um, the human health risk for loggers who need to crawl around in that slash if they're under contract to lop the tops and, and get the slash closer to the ground. Um, the majority of landowners are receptive to that. Now there may be some particular areas near recreational locations on their property where they want to have less slash evident by and large uh, education of those landowners works pretty well. Well, it looks like the questions have slowed down. You all are a great audience. Um, I want to thank you for sticking around, and I very much want to thank Christy Sullivan for another great presentation. And I will, um, I've recorded uh, Tim Chick, Judson Bennett, Matt Carp, and Brian Knox as participating as certified foresters. I'll be sending your names to the Society of American Foresters to confirm your participation. Thank you guys for being here and I'll thank all the rest of you for participating as well. I look forward to seeing you um, or seeing that you're present on March 19th. We'll be having Jerry Carlson from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation talking about management options in anticipation of the emerald ash borer. So hopefully we'll see you then. Have a great evening. Thanks for joining us.